Hello, hey Boomer listeners. I hope everybody is having a wonderful Monday. As you remember, last week we spoke about living your legacy. And we talked about legacy meaning leaving something for the world, being bold and inspiring and vulnerable. And isn't writing a book kind of like that? When you create a book, and even more so when you get it published and you share it with the world, aren't you actually giving something of yourself to the world? You're creating something something that didn't exist before, and it's vulnerable. If any of you have ever tried to write something, a, a blog, a poem, a book, It's vulnerable to put your words out there where other people can see them and comment on them. But writers give us readers a gift of losing ourselves in their story. It's a gift of relating to the characters, relating to the places they go, finding characters that we love and characters that we don't like so much. And we're okay when those characters lose at the end. And we get to explore and travel and experience totally different realities than what we might be living. So my guest today, Deb Richardson Moore, is an author, and she's written several different books. She wrote her first book, I believe it was her first book, was a memoir called The Weight of Mercy. And that was written when Deb was a pastor at a... um, church and working with homeless. And we'll talk more about that. But she's also written some mysteries. She wrote a mystery series. And then she wrote her most recent book, which is also a mystery called Murder Forgotten. So what makes a good mystery? Well, a good mystery piques your interest at the beginning, right? And then as you're reading through it, you're trying to pick up the clues. You're trying to figure out, well, Could this person have done it? Maybe that one? Oh, no, that clue took me way off a different path. And at the end of every chapter, you're sitting there going, okay, let me see. If I put this there with that. So you become like this amateur detective as you're reading a mystery. And I have to say, that's exactly what happened with me as I was reading Murder Forgotten. It was a engrossing mystery story. And it really wasn't until the end that I started to gather all of the clues that had come together and figure out, oh, okay, now I'm getting it. But then there was always this twist at the end, right? So we're going to talk about that book as we um, go forward. And I just wanted to let you all know that um, a bunch of us did our forest bathing experience last week. It was wonderful, very nurturing. And I want to thank everyone who attended. I want to thank all of the sponsors. I want to thank our gracious guide and host, Angie Stiegel. And as soon as I get pictures back from that, I am going to post all of that in the blog so you can see some of what we experienced. And also I will be sure to note the sponsors so that you can also reach out and thank and support them. We are also planning another event for June. This is going to be a virtual seminar so everybody can attend. And it's going to be a panel discussion with some amazing experts in the field of aging. Um, We're gonna be talking about thriving after the pandemic and thriving being the operative word. So look for more information on that. If you would like to be part of the email list to get information about what's going on, um, to get a reminder Monday morning so you don't have to go searching for the link, you can email me at wendy at heyboomer.biz. You can also go to the website at heyboomer.biz, and you can uh, sign up there, subscribe to the blog, and that will automatically add you to the email list. So we'd love to have you as part of our community. Please go ahead and join that. And I also um, want to encourage you, this is 
uh, a conversation between Deb and myself, but is also a conversation between Deb and all of you. So if you have questions or comments that you'd like to share with us, you can go ahead, <clears throat> include them into the chat. And as they come in and as they seem to fit into the conversation, I'm going to uh, bring them to your attention or bring them to Deb's attention. And I see lots of people saying hi already. They love your book, Deb. So let me bring you on. <laughs> Not They love all of your books. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of this great stuff. And they're putting posts oh, they're right. to <laughs> where they can find it. Yeah. So you have a big fan audience out <laughs> here. Um, I want to tell them a little bit about you first. So Deb Richardson Moore is an author, and she's the retired pastor of Triune Mercy Center, which is a mission church in Greenville, South Carolina, that brings homeless, working poor, middle class, and wealthy parishioners into community. That's pretty amazing. <clears throat> she worked for 27 years as a writer for the Greenville News. And then she received her Master's of Divinity degree in 2005 when she accepted the position as pastor at Tryon Mercy Center. Deb is the author of a memoir, as we mentioned in the beginning, The Weight of Mercy, about her first three years as pastor among the homeless. And this book was named to the 2016 reading program for the United Methodist Women Worldwide. She then published her Brannigan Powers Mystery Series. And the three books in that series are The Cantaloupe Thief, The Cover Story, and Death of a Jester. And these are set against the backdrop of a homeless encampment. Her most recent book, Murder Forgotten, is a standalone mystery, and it is set on the South Carolina coast. Deb was given the 2020 Humanitarian Award by United Housing Connections, which also announced they're going to name a community center after you. That's very That's much perfect. of an honor. Good for you. She has won numerous other awards, and she is the graduate of Wake Forest University and Erskine Theological Seminary. She's married to Vince Moore, and they have three grown children, Dustin, Taylor, and Madison. And which one is getting married soon? Dustin. Dustin. <laughs> Yay, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So are you ready to jump in? Yes, yes. All right, let's go. So from my perspective, you've always been a writer. And I am curious about from where, where that uh, initial love of writing came from. Oh, that I think that was just in eighth. I remember in the second grade, my um, teacher gave me a challenge and she said, I, I, I think you need to do something above what I'm asking for in the coursework. She said, and I said, like, write a book. <laughs> and she, said, she said, yeah, yeah, do that. Well, I wrote a book called How the West Was Won. In second grade. I'm really realizing the book had been written before, <laughs> far better than a second grader was going to do it. But I I wrote it. And so, so yeah, that's where it started. And then um, I, I was, I mean, I'm probably like every other mystery writer in the history of the universe. I read every Nancy Drew book, Hardy Boy, Bobsy Twin, and then graduated to Agatha Christie. And I just loved that. So in the back of my mind, I guess I always wanted to write something like Agatha Christie did, but it just took me many, many decades to get there. So you, you always knew you wanted to be a writer in some form. So when you went to Wake Forest, did you get a journalism degree? Well, actually, uh, I, I knew I was going into journalism. Wake Forest it did not have a journalism degree. Their theory was you work on the student newspaper, you you learn journalism by doing it, by practicing, and you major in something you wanted to write about. So I majored in political science. Oh, okay. All right. So then you went from there to your job at the paper. Right. Mm -hmm. Can you talk to us a little bit about your experience at the paper? Yeah, I, I loved that. I loved, because um, I was a feature writer, uh, just almost from the get-go. And I loved going in, learning a topic, whatever that was, from beginning to ending, whether it was just a, a person or an event or whatever, 
but just uh, every every story was sort of a mini research project. And you got out and you got to talk to people and you got to meet such interesting people and then come back to the office and create the story. So I loved both halves of that that process. 27 years, Deb, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 27 years. And during that time, were you still pondering mystery writing? Were you thinking about writing um, a book? You know, not actively. I think at one point, I, well, I know at one point I took about a year or nine months off. It was having one of the children. And during that time, I started trying to write what turned out to be the cantaloupe thief. But at that point, I just could not get going on. Of course, I had a toddler and then a newborn and I just could not make any progress on it. And um, so I put it aside and didn't return to it till nearly uh, 25, 30 years later. Mm -hmm. Wow. But you still had the bones of it from uh -huh. way back then. Interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So 27 years into your career, you decide to make a complete pivot. Mm -hmm. What brought that on? Well, as I say, God tricked me into seminary. <laughs> No, what happened was I had taken on the religion beat. And a lot of times what would happen when I would take on a new beat is I would go to classes. Like when I took on the art beat, I went over to the Greenville County Museum of Art and studied paintings, you know, for a while. Okay. And um, just, just, to, just to bone up a little bit. And that was all in the world that I was doing. I had taken on the religion beat and I told the managing editor, I said, you know, I need to learn a little more. Um, I'm going to go to some classes. And he said, that's fine. We can probably help you pay for them. And what I meant by that was to go to classes in comparative religion, to learn mm -hmm. Buddhism and Islam, because I'd grown up in Christianity, but I wanted to learn enough, some, some little something about the others. Well, there was no such, uh, I was looking for a master's, at, you know, in comparative religion. There was no such thing. Clemson mm -hmm. didn't have it. Furman didn't have it. And so quite by accident, I actually ended up in a seminary, Christian seminary down in due west, which was Erskine. And just, you know, kind of just loosey goosey, just you know, entered into my first classes down there, which was a New Testament. And it was just like, oh, my gosh. I've always wanted to know this. I've always wanted to know how the Bible came together. And what was so intriguing was in that very first um, class of seeing how the New Testament writers created their stories. And I was looking at it just exclusively from a writer's perspective of how um, these, especially the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their portraits of Jesus were very much fashioned on who they were and how they wrote those stories depending on their interest and their, you know, who they happened to be. And I just, to me, it was almost like journalism. These were the first pictures that the church had of Jesus because of who those writers were. And so I just was so um, intrigued by that that I got deeper and deeper and decided to go into spending my life among those stories instead of writing for the newspaper. That is such an interesting perspective to come at it from as a writer. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. And then, so finally you get into Try and Mercy Center. Were you looking for, um, a church with a mission greater than just being a preacher at a Christian church? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I was. I, that was always, missions had always uh, been my interest in, in all my churches. I was, you know, a lot of times I would be the mission director, mission coordinator for my Sunday school class, stuff like that. And when I looked at Triune from the outside, I thought, oh my gosh, that's important work. That's what I want to do. Had I known what I was getting into, I probably never would have taken it because it just about killed me. And um, I did not 
understand how hard it was going to be and how um, uh, it, it was just, it, it was really difficult. However, a large part of that also was being a, a an ordained Baptist woman. I didn't have a lot of pulpits open to me either. Mm. And so I think that, uh, so when I got into triune, I do think that helped me, kept me from quitting because mm. I think quite honestly, a lot of people would have quit because it was not pleasant. And, um, you know, there were d drug dealers and uh, who I was having to deal with all the time and people quite literally defecating in the breezeway of the church. And just a lot of uh, got spit on, got lied to, got yelled at uh on a daily basis. And so I think if I had had another opportunity to go somewhere else, I might have quit and done that. But I knew if I quit here, I'm not going to have any place to go, nor did I feel like I should. I felt mm -hmm. like if I can't make it here, if I can't love these people, I don't deserve another church. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's that's a tough message. So you yeah. included all of that into the weight of mercy. And I was so intrigued by how you opened the show talking about vulnerability, because that was my biggest. Um, and I don't think I've really spoken much about this, but I that that book was very hard for me to write. Number one, because I had to go and revisit a lot of the painful, hurtful early days. But also, I didn't think it was very well written and I, I could not make I didn't know how to make it better. And I was too afraid to call together a writer's group at that point. And I had mm. I had a couple of ministers who I talked to about it, who were also writers. And they said, you, you got to let somebody read it. And I said, well, I just don't think it's good enough. And finally, uh, Matt Matthews, who was the pastor over at St. Giles Presbyterian, said, Deb, you cannot be the judge of this. She, he said, you're too close to it. You don't know if it's good, bad or indifferent. You've got to get it in front of other people. And so at that point, I started sending it out to agents and publishers because when they told me no, it was like, well, I don't know them. That didn't hurt a lot. Mm -hmm. And so finally, and a publisher in England picked it up. And so it got published. And later on, that uh, that gave me the um, the courage to write the mysteries and pull together a writer's group and use oh. and, and, and and they changed. And I always regretted that I had not used that for the weight of mercy that I hadn't let friends see it early on because they might have suggested improvements. But isn't it interesting, Deb, that you wrote 27 years feature stories for the paper <laughs> without that concern, uh -huh, and uh -huh. now you're writing, but this was more personal. I guess so. But, oh, yeah, because uh, in the newspaper, I couldn't wait for the things to come out and get the comments and get feedback. But this, whoo, number one, book length was a whole different ball game. But number two, yeah, it was so personal. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and it was really kind of laying my soul bare. And I yeah. just, that was a whole nother animal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got it out there. Yeah, me too. me too. Yeah. So I want to talk about the mystery books because that's more of what you write. And I believe in joy writing. Oh, yeah. Yes. It, they really are fun. So as a writer, do you know where it's going from the beginning? Do you know who your characters are? Or does this kind of evolve as you go? It evolves as I go. Um, and that that's the one question that always comes up at every writer's conference or anything <laughs> else. And every writer is different. Um, I met one very famous, uh, Jeffrey Archer, at, uh, at, at a conference. And he was saying he writes a 150-page he called it an outline, but that's really a, more of a skeleton, I think. And and then he goes back and adds to that. Um, it, but I I just don't understand how somebody does that. Does that somebody else may outline and then try to write to certain markers? That that doesn't work for me. So what I do is I just start, and then as you're writing, things occur to you and directions and, and and you know often you're going to have to go back and change or plant clues or 
take out a character or put in a character. But that's the only way to, that is interesting to me. Mm. That's how I, I want to come to my desk every morning is if I'm eager to see what happens next. Oh, so you're exploring at the, yeah. the wow. Um, and do you become like attached to your characters? Do they become like friends for you? Huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. So I want to talk about Murder Forgotten a little bit without giving it away. Um, but I, 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 you know, the, the, the story is about a writer, right. which, I, which I thought was really interesting. Um, her name is Juliana, and she describes kind of getting lost in her own mind as she's creating the story. So is that similar to kind of letting it evolve or is your experience similar to what you described for Juliana? Yeah. And, and um, what the, the best time in a book is when like you can go for a walk and that whole hour of your walking, you are living in that other world. Um, and you're thinking about those characters and you're thinking about what, what they might be feeling. And so that way it's almost like you're not really making stuff up as much as you are just listening to what, mm. you know, let your mind just wander. And so that was what I gave to her. And then I went a step further and I gave her this sort of um, special thing that where she um, literally uh, almost has a, fugue state or an out-of-body experience where her her uh plots come together and she um will will emerge from them and just work feverishly for like 24 hours and because she's a very famous writer and has been very right. successful and i was trying to create a reason that 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 she was uh so successful but then the twist is that, uh, and this again comes from me because my memory is like Swiss cheese. Um, and so I just, you know, I was thinking, and I, you know, especially at Triune, I was trying to remember names. That was where I really struggled with the names of all these people because Triune was a very transient place. And it wasn't like a normal congregation where the pastor learned all of, all of the congregants. I had maybe 150 like that, but the other 100 and 125 were constantly rotating in and out. Mm. And so I was, um, so I, I was struggling with that. And so I was, yeah, I was, and, and you just start thinking of things, you know, and you, it was like, okay, what if you were a famous mystery writer and all of your energy and everything you did depended on your memory and you started losing it? Mm. What? Oh my gosh, you know, what might that be like? What might that lead to? And so that was where um that character's predicament came from. Yeah, it was so interesting. In fact, the what's the subtitle? How can you find the truth when your reality is fading? Mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and it definitely winds you through that experience for her. You you portrayed that really well. Oh, well, thank um, you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I knew at the same time. Um, I, I, I did not want to spend all the time on her because I didn't want people to get depressed or think it was a book about dementia or anything like that. And so I was trying to put just enough of her in to give you the feeling of what she was facing, but then bring in the daughter to do a lot of the detective work mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just to, 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 to give the reader, uh, you know, not a, a break. That, that that you know it wasn't going to all be this this struggling character, right? Right, and the daughter and the friends that she has, mm -hmm. and yeah, the, yeah. the difficult brother, and mm -hmm. <laughs> I know it was a lot of good characters in there. Um, and did you did you change those characters as you went along, or are they pretty much oh, okay? Oh yeah, especially like it, because I had I think what my my problem was in my early books. Everybody was perky. <laughs> my, my writers group <laughs> accused me of being eternally perky, and you know, so so everybody's good and honest, and and you know that that only is not like real life. It's also not very interesting, mm -hmm. and so 
so I have to really work to create a Harrison, the brother mm. who is not very likable or um, the, uh, yeah, what was her Li- name? Liza's, Not, right. Li- I was thinking Liza's boyfriend. Oh, right. Who had the restaurant. Yes. Restaurant on her. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that does not come naturally to me. So I have to, I have to really try to, to bring in characters who are edgier and sharper and meaner sometimes. Yeah. So does your writer's group help you with that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, yeah. I'll never forget back in, um, the cantaloupe thief. It started out, and this is how good a, a writer's group does. It started out, there was Brannigan, who was a newspaper reporter, and there was a woman minister at the homeless church. And um, my writer's group said, they're too much alike. We can't be, you know, we, no. there's not, you know, which because they were both coming from me. For, by right. primary. So they said, why don't you make one of them fat? <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> fat. and so, but what I did was I made one of a male. <laughs> oh, they were both so female made, originally. They were both female originally. And I changed the minister to male and, uh-huh. and, and they were right. That would, that gave them some distance. Um, and they were real good friends, but they weren't so alike. They were, they were very much being able to, to v- differentiate. And that, that's what a writer's group can do for you. They don't always give you a solution, but they say, this isn't working. You know, uh-huh. this is uh, this is holding us back from enjoying the story. Yeah. And so in a writer's group, everybody is a writer sharing their stories and then you come together and critique. Is that how that works? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Interesting. OK, so another thing about the book, Juliana, the writer in the book, um, really hates dislikes strongly the publicity tours that she has oh. to do. How do you feel about them? Um, well, now, if, if if there really is a publicity tour, well, I love that. <laughs> I've just never been on one um, because they don't really, you know, unless you're Nicholas Sparks, we're not really getting that. Mm. Um, I love the speaking and the what, podcast like this and especially book clubs. And, and some of that is just now coming back and um, speeches. That's great. That's fine. What I don't like is trying to publicize the book, if that makes sense, um, of, of trying to go online and promote it and that kind of thing. That is painful for me. And I think most of us, because it just comes across as tooting your own horn. You yeah. know, if somebody else invites you to speak, yay, you know, yeah. that's, that, yeah. that's not that. But, but to, you know, to get out there and try to get people to buy and online, that's, that's the hard part. Yeah. So um, some of the comments I just wanted to share with you that, you know, people are saying, hi, they love you. And, and <laughs> Ann Golden, Gail Quay. Um, (laughs) Doris, Kathy, and Beth Gaffer. And then um, Heidi Woody related very much to your comments about working with the drug addiction, the alcohol addiction. She says, yeah, it's good people with an awful disease. Um, I don't know if you'd like to comment on that a little bit more. Oh, Beth also worked with homeless people. Very difficult, but very rewarding. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I have friends now um, that I never, I would never would have had a way of meeting or knowing before, and I and I mean that very sincerely that they are that they are friends um, that have lived outside. Now, fortunately, um, our, one of our things at Triune was that we hired social workers and tried to get them into housing. Sometimes it might it took us nine years to convince somebody that they would be better off in housing. And, you know, this is America. It was their choice. Um, But sure, that just, um, and and when I took the job, I did not realize how much addiction was playing into homelessness, Mm -hmm. at least in Greenville. Now, that's not always the case, but here it was a huge driver. And so that was where we focused a lot of our energy was uh, on rehab. Um, starting with rehab, 
and then trying to get in, people into housing, driver's license, jobs, whatever. Um, but boy, that addiction, that because you can imagine if an addiction has led somebody to live on the street, mm -hmm. it's pretty severe. And they have probably tried repeatedly to kick it. And um, so, so yeah, just, you know, living with people and, and, and learning their struggles. Um, yeah, it just opens your eyes to a whole nother sphere. Um, but also um, some of the kindest people I met, you know, that who would share what they had even though they had next to nothing. It must have been continuously challenging though to see, yeah. you know, and 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 what about stories of people that actually broke through that addiction and found homes? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, we estimated, um, I think we sent about during my time there about 1600 people into drug or alcohol rehab. And wow. we estimated that about close to a third of the men succeeded in getting sober and move, moving on. And maybe, but women was only about 10%. Huh. And we, you know, kind of kept thinking, you know, wondering what, what was behind that. And then we finally uh, learned, we, you know, talking through a lot of, to a lot of doctors and addiction specialists that the woman's brain is very often more complex than the male brain. And it was harder to get her off of drugs and alcohol. And then simultaneously, we learned that a lot of times um, uh, abuse, sexual abuse was behind uh, a woman's that severe, you know, yeah, who, who yeah. was out on the street. So what we did was we went to Nashville and we learned about a ministry up there and we joined with Christ Church and Bon Secours to create Jasmine Road, which oh. was a ministry to get women out of the sex trade. And we we had hired a woman who was working at Triune to do that very thing. And so then she went on to become director at Jasmine Road. That's Beth Messick. And that they were tackling that. Uh, that idea because almost all of those women had been addicts, alcoholics, and, and almost all of them had been sexually molested for the first time between the ages of seven and 11. And it had literally changed their brain and their brain patterns and all of that. So there was a lot of work to be done. And we are so proud of that, um, that ministry that's going forward. So all of that is just a, you know, it's just a, a really hard, difficult knot of yarn to start unraveling. There are a lot of pieces to it. And I was not an expert. That's why I hired people to, mm -hmm. to do that work. Yeah. You've probably learned more than you ever expected to know yes, about yes, that. Sir. Yeah. So um, when you changed your career and, you know, because Hey Boomer is really about yes. inspiring people to live full lives, to give back to their community, to be involved in whatever way works for them. So when you changed your career at 51 and you then moved into book writing, um, what inspired, I mean, we talked a little bit about the inspiration to do the religion, but what inspired the initial, all right, I'm sitting on this cantaloupe um, story. I'm, I'm going to write this way. What inspired you to really sit down and start writing? Right. Um, well, the, the the first book was The Weight of Mercy. And what inspired that was um, I was beginning to forget. And that going in, you know, when I talked about trying to write back at my second baby and I was about 30 years old, I just I just couldn't. I, I don't I, I to this day, I don't know what was holding me back. But when when I got got into ministry and I wasn't writing every day for the newspaper and it was so. Um, I just felt like those experiences I was having at Triune were informative and um, I didn't want to lose them. And after a few years, I was beginning to forget because things were a whole lot better. They were, we were chugging along. We were getting new members. And, and I thought, I don't want to forget what happened. And so that was why I sat down to write The Weight of Mercy. And um, so once, once that 
got done and I, I knew I could write a full length book. And that is the hard part because you have this inner critic inside your head saying, what are you doing? This is boring. <laughs> Why would you think anybody's interested in this? Right. And so you've really got to pop that thing down. And so once a publisher said, yes, we want to publish this, I can't tell you how freeing that is. So that was when I said, OK, I want to go write that mystery that I've always had in the back of my mind. And literally, that was, oh, more more than almost three decades after I had first tried to write it. So amazing. But I think all of us need something. We need some kind of boost. And that, that's what's so hard to this day is, um, be, you know, finding finding readers and, you know, getting enough feedback that you want to go on. And and I can't tell you how many writers have books in their desk drawer mm -hmm. um, that either they've never sent out or was sent out and rejected. And you just have to forget about that. And just because, I mean, I'll send them out. I, I, I mean, there's no such thing as too many rejections. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just uh, over in a, and you and you you learn not to take that personally and not to have a thin skin and to say it's not for they don't know me. They just for whatever reason, they don't want to publish this book. Maybe they don't like murder mysteries. Maybe they don't like my writing. Maybe they don't like the beach, you know, whatever. Um, but you just can't, they, they're not saying they don't like you. Yeah. That's an interesting, that's a, yeah, a good way to look at it. Um, Doris says, is there a story to your finding this publisher? You have a publisher out of England, you said? Yeah, no, no, no story. Really. I was just sending out um, uh, queries, you know, just like you do. And I had sent, I'd been turned down by about 17 agents, I think. And so I started saying, well, maybe I can't get an agent, but I'm just going, some publishers were, would accept uh, unsolicited manuscripts. And so I just started sending them to them. Hmm. And uh, uh, th this one in, in England took it. And, the, you know, we've had, some, we've had some bumps in the road because they um, went into uh, sort, of, sort of bankruptcy. It, it's, it's the Ooh. UK version. It's not that. It's called something else going into administration, I think. And so then I, we got, um, after, I think I got all the way through Murder Forgotten and they were going to take it, but they said they weren't taking any more manuscripts after that. Hmm. And so now, but then late after now in the last few weeks, I've got something they've been bought again. They've had some sales. <laughs> so, so now they've, they're they under new ownership. So who knows? Who knows? And believe me, I am not alone. There are so many writers I've met who they were called orphans now that mm. their publishers have gone out of business or stopped accepting a certain genre of books or all kind of different reasons why you but, lose your publisher. So so are you telling me now that if you have a new book that you're working on, which I want to know about, if you do, mm. you're going to have to search for a publisher again? I think so. I think oh. so be, because um, Lion Hudson is, is a Christian publisher, and this latest is is not you know any overtly Christian in any way. It's a it's a it's a story set in a gentrifying neighborhood in a southern city because I'm so intrigued by gentrification, and so you have this um, <clears throat> tension between these new people moving into these $800,000, $900,000 houses and the mill houses that have mm -hmm. been in that neighborhood before and the few people who haven't yet sold out. And so, and then there's homeless, um, there's a gospel mission and a uh, homeless encampments near that. So there's your tension. Mm -hmm. And then the murder plays out against that backdrop and you don't know whether it's got something to do with that or if it was completely a different reason. Mm. Now, Murder Forgotten is not an overtly Christian book no. either. No. It's not. And I was kind of surprised they they wanted it. OK, uh, they but they they I guess because I was already on their roster, they mm -hmm. published it. But, yeah, I was like you. And even one of my editors said something at one point as she was going over. She said, do you not want to insert something 
about, uh, you know, and I said, no, I, I don't think I do. I don't think I want to shoehorn it, you know. Yeah, yeah, you'd have to make it fit somewhere. And, uh, and yeah. there, is the char- there is the character there at the Methodist Church on right. Sullivan's the- Island. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, so there's that, but but you're right. It's certainly not overly Christian at all. No. So, Deb, what would be two or three takeaways that you could leave with the audience to get them past their vulnerability of taking a risk, whether it's with a new job, a volunteer, writing a story, writing a song? What would be your takeaways for them? Well, it's kind of what you said in your, I think it was your most recent blog, The um, when you were talking about dreaming uh-huh. and, and um and, and, that you, and that you had had that dream for six years uh-huh. before acting on it. Yeah. Um, I think that's a lot of us do that. We have something percolating in our brain. I think I mispronounced that word percolating, <laughs> um, but in our brain and maybe something triggers us into it. And so, so number one, I would say be listening for your innermost desire. Um, and then um, it doesn't even have to be related. I, uh, I'm i a big believer now. I, I used to think in terms of success and failure. If a marriage ended in divorce, it had failed. I don't think that way anymore. I think now in terms more of seasons, mm. because uh, um, that marriage had its season. Mm-hmm. And certainly if it produced children, you know, it was not a failure um or or even if it didn't it, you know if you had 20 good years how are you going to say that's failure so i see seasons and i believe in that we have seasons of our life you know like you had previous careers and then you mm-hmm. created the, you know now you're in a season of this amazing podcast um and i'm seeing more and more people retiring in their mid 60s with good health and I think that's a third act mm-hmm. um, or, 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 you know, depending on what you did. My, it was this, this is my third act. Right. After, you know, for Greenville News and then ministry and then writing um, might be somebody else's fourth act, fifth act. But I, yeah, I just think there are opportunities and there are, are times in our lives that just open up. And, and give us uh, permission to do things. And, you know, and, and a lot of times retirement, it's no longer needing to be paid um, a, as much or or at all. And, and, and you know, so that, that creativity can thrive then. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, just, just, you know, listening to your, your innermost listening. desires. I think that's exactly brilliant listening because if you're not listening you don't see those doors those opportunities open up so yeah thank you for that deb um and deb has graciously offered a gift to our listeners so we're doing a little book contest um she has offered to give away two books the murder forgotten story but you have to enter to win (laughs) And the way you enter is you're going to send me an email. I'll show my email address again. And in that email, you're going to be able to tell us what about the South Carolina coast intrigues you and what would make you want to read Murder Forgotten. So those two things. What about the South Carolina coast intrigues you and what would want to make you read Murder Forgotten? Once we get all the entries, let's say by the end of the day, Wednesday, because some people do listen to this later, um, then we will pick two winners and Deb will contact you to get your email address. If you would like to contact Deb, you can look at her website at www.debrichardsonmore.com. And you can read about the other books she has, the things she's doing, as well as um, contact the author. (laughs) So this has been fabulous. Thank you so much, Deb, for being my here. Yeah. Um, Let me just tell people about who's going to be here next week. Um, His name is Sander Flom. And I was introduced to Sander because of a book he wrote about overcoming stuttering. 
And I thought, well, that's a pretty big thing to overcome. And then, of course, you know, with Joe Biden deal, dealt with that as well. So I thought, well, that could be interesting. But when I spoke to him, there's so much more. He's 84 years old. He still runs his own company. And I was intrigued by some of the other books that he has written. Like he took a hundred mile walk with his son and they talked about leadership and they talked about what does it mean to lead and all these different kinds of things. So Sander is a leader. He's a speaker, even with the stuttering. He's on the board of several universities and hospitals and he loves what he's doing. And he has mostly overcome his stutter. Um, just to let you all know that he had, he said to me, Oh, can we do the show earlier? Because it, he's better in the morning. And I said, well, it's one o'clock. That's when we do it live. So he will meditate before we speak, he said, so that he'll be ready for the show. But I think that will be a wonderful, interesting show. And certainly inspiring, 84 years old and still going strong. <laughs> um, I always like to end with a quote from C.S. Lewis, where he said, you are never too old to set another goal or dream a new dream. And with that, I thank you all for joining us today. Wonderful comments. You'll go back and look at them, Deb, later. And I, I know everybody's time is valuable, so I really appreciate that everybody joined us today. Thank you so much. My name is Wendy Green, and this has been Hey Boomer. <laughs>